right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another Get Response webinar, How to Improve Conversions by Building Trust Online. And today, we are together with a very special guest, Tim Ash. Uh, Tim is an expert in user-centered design, persuasion, understanding online behavior, neuromarketing, and landing page testing. He is also the author of two best-selling marketing books, uh, Unleashing the, Pri uh, the Primal Brain and the Landing Page Optimization. Today, he is with us to talk about how to improve conversions by building trust online, a topic that he mastered over the years. Before we start, I'd like to remind you a couple of things. So the webinar will take around approximately 45 minutes, maybe 50, depending on the Q&A that will be later. So during the webinar, I will be helping Tim gather all of your questions so that at the end of the webinar, during the Q&A session, uh, he'll, he'll reply. Uh, so please feel free to write any question that you have in the chat box that you'll see on the left side of your screen. Also, uh, we will send a recording of this webinar to all of you. So don't worry if you have to be somewhere, maybe a doctor's appointment, which actually happened in the past, in the last webinar. Just, you know, don't worry, you will have the webinar recording by tomorrow. So without further ado, I'll give it to Tim. So Tim, you ready? Absolutely. Thank you so much. I'm very happy to be here and excited to share about online trust with uh, the audience. Uh, today we're going to talk about uh, basically the hard task that we have, which is building trust online. And online trust is different. Uh, when we build trust online, it's, um, it's kind of flying without a net or hopefully with a parachute in this case. Uh, but online trust building is difficult because it has to be done very quickly. When someone shows up on your website, they will form a first impression, a visual first impression of your landing page within 50 milliseconds. That's right, 1 20th of a second, about the same time it takes you to blink your eye once. So they already know if your website is trustworthy or it's not. I'm going to talk about appearance here in a minute, but it's a very, very hard task because that trust has to be formed quickly, unlike real life where you have lots of opportunities to interact with people over time and, and build a, a stronger relationship. And, but it, and it also is harder because it has to be done anonymously. Um, you don't know your online visitors. Now at this point, sometimes I've had my web analytics friends tell me, well, we, Tim, we know quite a bit about online visitors. We know what browser they're on. We know their screen size, their operating system. We can reverse uh, engineer their location via geotargeting, and and um, I would say that that's true, but it doesn't really help you with anything important. You don't know who they are, how they think, how they make decisions, what they care about, what they value. All of those things that you need to persuade them are not there inside of your kind of physical environment um, or the browser settings. So you really don't know that much about them. And it gets even worse. I mean, you don't know your visitors, as I said, and they don't really want to know anything about you. So how are you expected to build trust when your visitors are basically there to accomplish a task? They're there to do something. They're there to uh, buy, to download, to maybe find the the phone number and call you, uh, whatever their conversion action is that we want them to take, they're there to solve their problem by interacting with you. They don't really want to know too much about you. So basically, here's the problem that we face as online marketers. Building trust has to precede the conversion. How can you ask someone to do something when they don't really trust you? That's very hard to do in real life, and it's even harder to do online. So the rest of this uh, webinar, we're going to spend talking about exactly how to do that and some general principles that we found out that work over the years to build trust online very quickly. So let's talk about uh, what I call the four pillars of building trust online. And uh, the best way to build trust is actually to combine them, but I'm going to talk about them individually, and then at the end we'll talk about what it looks like when you combine all of that in your web experience. So let's talk about the first of these, which is appearance. As I mentioned, visual first impressions of your site are formed very, very quickly. 
And the thing about them is that they affect conversion, we know that, and they can't be undone. In other words, once I form a first impression of it, it's too late. So even if it's uh, doing something silly, for example, buying weightlifting equipment, let's say you came to this website, and you decided to buy weightlifting equipment. Uh, maybe you could put in the chat window, would you buy weightlifting equipment from this website? Just a yes or no in the chat. I'm guessing if you're like most of us, the answer is a big no. Yeah, John's got a capital no. Oh, okay, well, we have a, one yes so far, but most people are saying no, not really, no. And, and that's typically the case because this website is horrible. Now, I could make fun of the graphic designers that designed it, but obviously there were none involved in the design of this page. It was probably done by the nephew of the person that runs this website or something like that. And here's the worst part of it. I took this picture a long time ago. As you can see, I put this in my first edition of my book back in 2007. I took another picture of it yesterday. This is their site today, folks. You can go there right now, newyorkbarbells.com, if you don't believe me. It's this bad. 12 years later. Now, I know that this isn't exactly the sexiest type of stuff to buy, weightlifting equipment and racks and so on, but still, you'd think that the standard of quality by which you're judging them, the first impression, would be better than this. Well, let me switch to another type of example. I live in San Diego. It um, has the wonderful climate and a wonderful standard of living. And uh, there are a lot of Bodhi people here. We're right next to the Pacific Ocean. So let's say I want to buy a yacht. Of course, most of us don't have money to buy a yacht. In fact, I don't have enough money to buy a yacht. Uh, I think somebody once described yachts as holes in the water that you throw money into. I think that's pretty accurate. But let's say you had enough money to do that. And you came to this website. And I found these in the search results when I went to search for San Diego yachts. And I'd say, this is a beautiful site. It's clean, it's uncluttered, it's modern. It's giving you that, evoking that feeling of what it'd be like for you to have that yacht experience by having that beautiful picture. And you can just imagine yourself being on it, right? Now, unfortunately for their competitors, this is what happened when I clicked on Seacoast Yachts. You got it. I actually got an under construction pop-up that tried to do an email grab from me. Why would you want your first impression to be under construction? That's such a horrible thing to say. It says, we're not prepared for you. We don't even want you to be here. But let's say that you saw past the email grab and you just dismissed that pop-up. This is the underlying page that you see. So my question is, is this as impressive as the last one? In other words, if you were buying a yacht, would you want to see pictures of the yacht or San Diego Harbor with a bunch of yachts really far away in the distance? In other words, would you want to see this picture or would you want to see this one? Now you could say the, the San Diego lifestyle shot is okay, but okay isn't the same as really, really good. So even okay is not good enough. But it gets worse, folks. Again, this is just right from the search results when I look for San Diego Yacht. This is Cabrillo Yacht Sales. This is their website right now today. Uh, I, I, I'm not going to say anything because you can see how horrible it is. Uh, we have that wonderful aerial shot. The production quality of this thing looks like it was done by, you know, somebody in kindergarten. A little five-year-old child made this website. Would you buy a yacht? from this company? That's my question. And the answer, I'm guessing again, is going to be no, just like with the barbells example. So first impressions really, really matter. And so my guidelines for you is don't get disqualified based on how you look. And this has a lot of components to it. It's the professionalism of the design, how open and clean it is. You don't want it to be too cluttered or stuffed visually with too many elements or different background colors or too many images. And very, very importantly, a part of this is the organization and clarity of your own thinking about it. Because how you present ideas, how simple you make them, really, really affects that first impression. So most elegant designs 
whether it's in furniture or, or high-tech electronics or websites, are usually clean and simple. They're uncluttered. And the messaging is clear. What is this for? What are the benefits of it? That sort of thing. So you really, really have to focus on it. And as you can see, even in 2019 right now, there are a lot of really horrible websites out there. So don't get disqualified based on how your website looks. So that is the first pillar of online trust. That first impression is going to get made instantly, and you don't want them to hit the back button because that's always an option. Your competitors are there. Whether they're better or worse than yours, if I find your website to be unprofessional, I'm hitting that back button. And you'll never see me again. All right, let's talk about the second pillar of, of online trust, and that is transactional assurances. Now, most of you listening to this webinar will probably think this is a little strange, but when you're sitting in front of a web browser, there are moments of high anxiety, and hopefully not created by me in this case, but um, if you're on a website and you're thinking of buying something, you're actually having a fight, flight, or freeze response, just like you would in the real world if a bear was attacking you or chasing you. In other words, when you're asked to buy something on a website, this is a time of really, really strong anxieties. Now, you may not feel this or think about it, but when you're about to check out on a website, here's what actually happens. Your heart rate goes up. Your blood vessels constrict. You start tapping your foot ever so slightly as preparation for running away in case you have to. All of this kind of anxiety and fear response is triggered by your body because somebody is asking you to give up your money give up a resource, something you need to survive. So the deep survival parts of the brain kick in and they tell you, be ready for anything. This might turn into an emergency or a bad situation very, very quickly. So when you're at this moment, you've asked someone to open their wallet. When you're at this moment, that's the time to relieve their anxieties. I'll give you an example. Uh, here's the tire rack they sell tires, uh, obviously online, and at the bottom of the page there, you can see they have some, as they've made some efforts to alleviate this anxiety because they say, look, we take Visa and MasterCard and American Express and PayPal and we're Norton secure and we're, you know, have a very high 4.8 out of 5 Google customer rating. So, you know, we're really good people and don't be afraid of anything. Everything is good here. So, What's the problem with this page? Can someone chat and tell me what's the problem with those trust symbols on this page? And I have to tell you I'm cheating a little bit. Anybody know? Too much info? Highlighting the stress? They're on the bottom. Thank you, Andrea. Andrea got it. So I said I was cheating a little bit, so let me go on to the next slide. This is the full page, folks. I didn't show you the top of the page. That was the very, very footer. Do you see how long this page is? It has a lot of sections, I'm sure a lot of useful information. But what's wrong with those trust symbols being on the very, very, very bottom? Well, the, what's wrong with it is in most situations, only 10 to 15% of people will scroll down that far. So I'm going to repeat this throughout the webinar, this basic idea but that if your trust building is going to have an impact, it has to be seen. Great question. Where is it supposed to be? Well, it's supposed to be at the point where it can influence your trust. So if you're checking out, and I'm going to show this on a product detail page next, it's supposed to be visible. So if I just say it this way, hey, you have some very powerful trust symbols. Do you want 85 to 90% of people to never see them? You'd probably say, no, that's really stupid. But a lot of your trust symbols are probably buried in the footer of your website. So it's okay to have them there. But ideally, like you're not just uh, chatted, you know, you want them above the fold. The only way it's going to have an impact is if people see them. I, some of you may not be familiar with this concept of above the fold, but like in a newspaper, you know, the front page before you fold the newspaper. But that's the above the fold stuff. And in the case of 
online experiences, when we talk about above the fold, we mean visible in the first screen fold. Uh, and obviously that's a little bit of a, a, a squishy concept because we have different screen sizes. There's, I'm sitting here in front of two 27 inch monitors and some people are looking at this webinar probably on their smartphone and they're very different above the fold experiences. So you have to work extra hard obviously on mobile to get it above the fold. Uh, and by the way, it's actually worse than that. If you're looking at a computer screen, whether it's a laptop or something like that, or a desktop, people don't actually look at the bottom third of the screen. That's right. What they do is they'll scroll to bring it up higher on the page and look at it when it comes into that area. So their eyes don't actually drop down all the way to the bottom of the page most of the time, unless they're very deliberately looking for something. Okay, in which case they'll examine every little detail. But if you're going to have these trust symbols there, they have to be visible. Let's look at this in the context of a product detail page. So again, the right idea, but not necessarily the best placement for it. So this is a product detail for a um, wireless security camera. And it's a clean site. Again, no problem with production value or appearance. Very elegant. Um, they have every, all the information you need except the trust stuff. And that's way, way down there at the bottom of the page, as you can see above the footer. And it's really good trust stuff. It's safe and secure with Norton. We deliver by FedEx, UPS, and DHL. These are all trusted delivery methods. We accept a wide range of payment methods, including PayPal and all the credit cards you'd expect. And then they have this second band of trust, which is call us now. You're not sure? Yeah, let's. we can help you. Email us. Live chat. Those are all great options. In fact, if you're doing e-commerce, I encourage you to have all of those other response mechanisms there too. So if you're not sure about the purchase, you know, essentially talk to us. And how you want to engage is up to you. That's exactly, uh, you know, we want to help you the way you want to be helped, not the way we want to help you. Does that make sense? <coughs> um, sticky footers are okay. Somebody mentions the sticky footer, but especially on mobile, that takes up too much vertical real estate. So, and a lot of the footers are pretty tall, like on this site. So, I wouldn't always recommend that. So, here's how to do it above the fold. This is Helmet City. They sell motorcycle helmets. Product detail page again on the site. So, you can see they have the McAfee Secure and the VeriSign right below the Add to Cart button, where it's visible and clear. And they have this kind of, well, it's not a sticky footer, but they have a sticky buy safe triangle in the lower left that's always going to be visible on that page. And you can click on that and get additional information about the buy safe guarantees and, you know, price match and all of that good stuff. So they kind of have this triple cocktail of really good trust symbols at the point of decision. So that add to cart button is pretty scary. It means I have to give you money. Basically, that's what's at the end of it. And that's where you want to relieve the anxiety at the point of sale. All right, let's talk about you know, the important things if you're going to do this. This is how you relieve point of action anxieties before they arise. Talk about your forms of payment and delivery. Um, whether you're going to spam me or the data security and the privacy. Even in the U.S. where it's been a really wide open situation. People are starting to care more and more about data privacy. In Europe, I know that certainly the GDPR standards and in the UK also is very, very strict on privacy. Uh, so, and then one final way of relieving anxiety is to say, it's okay, even if you do something, you can undo it. What are your return policies? Well, just return it uh, and we'll pay the shipping. Or guarantees if you're not happy with it we'll refund your money in full so all of those things relieve that anxiety and you have to do it before I buy it or before I even put it in the cart so this is a very important point if you do accept payment methods and most of you I'm guessing 90% of you if you sell something you talk about your payment methods on the first page of the checkout well guess what it's too late so the decision to check out has already been made and you made me make that decision without that element of trust, without me knowing what payment methods you accepted. 
So you could say, yeah, Tim, but they're in the footer, just like on some of the sites we've seen. That's okay, but I don't see the footer. I'm not going to scroll down to the footer to see this stuff. So it's really, really important for you to put the payment methods on the product detail page, for example, or in the header of your site where they're always visible, more visible places earlier in the process. That's the basic idea. Otherwise, they're not going to have an effect. Either I don't see it or I see it too late. Um, and I already decided whether to act or not. Do you see the effect on the conversion rate? If I don't know if you accept PayPal, and that's the only payment method that I have available to me, for example, I'm not going to buy it. I'm going to go to some other site where it's pretty clear that they accept PayPal right from the beginning. All right, let's talk about the third pillar, which is authority. Now, I'm going to I know uh, do this little scenario with you and play this out. Imagine that you have a problem with your appendix. In fact, it's getting swollen. It might burst. Bad news. Someone takes you to the hospital, and this gentleman walks in and says, I'm going to help you remove your appendix. Would you feel you know, pretty safe in his hands? I mean, it's not like you have a lot of choice, right? You're not going to go doctor shopping at that point. But if this guy walks into the room, you know, would he, how would you say, he looks like he's got enough experience to not have his hands shake when he's doing the surgery and cutting into you. And um, at the same time, you know, he's been around, done it, so he has experience and he's physically able to do it and mentally sharp enough to do it and he's got the stethoscope and all of that stuff, right? Okay, right, guess what? That's a stock photograph. This guy is not a doctor. But we feel good because he's wearing the costume, if you will, of a doctor. And we trust authority. We submit to authority if we're given the right costume. Uh, for example, when you walk into a court and you see the judge and they're wearing judge's robes, that instantly confers a certain authority on them and you comply with that authority or you trust that authority. Uh, I was in Australia, and the poor attorneys and judges in Australia actually have to wear those powdered wigs still. That, that is no fun, I will tell you. Uh, I saw one guy eating lunch. He had it on, on the lunch table next to him <laughs> during lunch outside of the court. Uh, but the point is that you're going to trust the trappings of authority. Uh, and you're going to, ideally, if you're an online marketer, one way to build trust is to borrow outside authority. So how many of you work for a world-class brand that everybody just instantly trusts? And you, can, you can put that in the chat, but I, I doubt many of us do. Uh, and what I mean by world-class, I'm talking like the Disneys and the Cokes and the, and the Sonys and the Mercedes-Benz. You know, most of us don't work for world-class brands. So one way that we can build trust is to borrow authority from others. And I'll show you several ways to do this. So the first is awards and trade associations that you're a part of. So um, I'll give you an example. Uh, uh, you know, here's a Bitdefender, and we help them kind of redesign their home page a little bit. They have antivirus software. Uh, well, is it good? Is it better than Norton or McAfee or Kaspersky? I don't know. Well, now you do because at the bottom of their homepage, I mean, well, actually above the fold, as we've been discussing of their homepage, are their awards and certifications. They are really good. In fact, I mean, from everything I've seen when they have uh, comparisons of the different antivirus softwares, they always come out on top in terms of the capabilities. They're the leader in the field, uh, not necessarily the, the biggest or the most well-known, but they have the best product. And um, they're saying that. We're proud of it. Here it is. Here's all the awards we've won. Um, and this matters. And, and associations, um, you know, you can be part of different uh, trade organizations. I'll give you an example from one of our clients a long time ago. Uh, this was a debt relief company. So if you have a lot of credit card debt, which is more common in the U.S., I would think, but um, and you want to negotiate your debt down with your creditors, these guys can help you. And their members, as you can see, I've highlighted in the lower right, various trade associations related to that finance industry. And so one of the things we did is we redesigned and tested this landing page form, and we made those trust symbols much more prominent. Okay. Now, again, unless you're in that industry, 
you probably don't know any of the highlighted trust symbols done in Bradstreet maybe, but some of those others, I don't know what they are, but the fact that they're members of those trade associations, they're basically saying we're proud of that, we're a good corporate citizen. And, and you, I don't have to even know what those symbols mean. I call it the butterfly collection. As long as they're pretty colors, <laughs> all the badges and everything, and they're prominent, they're going to have that effect. And in this case, it was a very, very dramatic effect. So this page performed 51% better than the previous one. And by the way, that's not just in online form fills. That's also, they had a toll-free telephone number on the site. And the number of phone calls also went up by about 50%. And those are even hotter leads for them. So they're very happy about that. So the, all, one of the things we did was just make the position of these trade associations and things they're members of more prominent on the page. Another way that you can borrow trust is marquee clients. Uh, in other words, your best well-known clients. You know, I mentioned the world-class brands. Of course, it helps that you know we've, we've all heard of Disney and Mercedes and Coca-Cola and Sony. Well, that's the point. And this is especially true of business to business. Um, when, if you're making a consumer decision, well, I want to buy that uh, wireless webcam that I showed you earlier. Okay, you know, I like it, I don't like it, it's $50, nothing bad's going to happen. If you're a company and you're deciding on some kind of major decision on how to run your company or improve your business, it could be a multi-million dollar disaster. It could destroy your business finances. It could get you fired. So business to business decisions are much more risk averse. They, they're higher stakes, if you will. So for example, here's Slack. Uh, most of you are probably familiar with that. So on their page right away, they say, look, we are used by Ticketmaster and the Airbnb and Target and Oracle and so on. And so they're basically saying, you know, trust us. You're making a business-to-business -business decision to use our software. Lots of bigger companies than yours do it, so don't be afraid. You can trust us. And further down the page, they actually have this rotating carousel with these little mini case studies or little cards uh, about you know uh, testimonials, essentially, but with the brand logos on them. And, and this is really important. Um, Sometimes the personal touch works, sometimes the logos are more important. For example, here's a company, Smartsheet. And it supports uh, work collaboration for businesses of all sizes, at least that's what they say. And this, is, this was their home page. Now that's great, look, and they have people, and they're the real people. Looks like if you look down in the middle of the page, it's, a, it's David, the VP of Project Management, and Noah and Amanda, the Senior Project Manager. I mean, they're, they're, they look like normal people, and they're, I'd like working with them as a company, but this isn't a professional services firm. I'm not actually going to deal with these people. That's not the point. The point is, does their software work? And then somewhere deeper in the site, buried two pages down, they had this wonderful page. Okay, now knowing that Netflix and Hilton and ESPN you and Sony Music use this software, that makes me much more likely to buy it than just looking at David, Noah, and Amanda, as nice as they are. So if you're in business to business, you should always, always, always put your marquee clients on the page. And I'll show you an example. One of our clients uh, did DVD duplication. So if you're a company and you want to have some specially stamped with your logo custom DVDs for whatever reason, this was the lead page they used for pay-per-click. And it's basically a quote page. What we did is we added all of their marquee client logos. And you might think that's a little extreme. I mean, we have 36 logos on that page. It takes up most of the page, in fact. But that resulted in a 58% increase over just the bare form by itself. And some of you are probably thinking, well, Tim, that's a little too much. It's overkill. I mean, why do you need 36? So we actually tested a version with just the top six logos in a single column on the right. And guess what? That 58% improvement went away. It was the same as if you had no logos. So sometimes more is better. Because if you're thinking, let's just put yourself in the shoes of someone you know, buying custom DVDs, 
duplication services for their company. If you came to this page, I can guarantee you I can read your mind. This is probably what you're thinking. Wow, these guys work with Microsoft and Nike and, and AT&T and Vivendi Universal and all these big companies. Huh, I wonder if they'll work with a company as small as mine. They're probably kind of expensive. So those might be some of the thoughts going through your head if you're, if you're the shopper for this product. But I know one thought that you're not thinking. Can they do the job? I'm sure that you have absolutely no question that they can do the job and handle your order. Uh, one question I often get asked about using corporate logos is, you know, did, should they link to their website? Uh, Michelle's asking, okay, I know this is being recorded, but I'm going to say it anyway uh, so the lawyers can go after me. Ask for forgiveness rather than permission. In other words, if you have a legitimate relationship with the company and they're your client and you don't have anything in your contract that says you can't even talk about that. Um, put their logo up there. And it doesn't have to be linked. In fact, it doesn't even have to be full color. You know, you, let me go back to the Slack example. This is supporting information. Slack's put it on their homepage, but they're grayscale. They're not linked. They're just there as trust symbols. So, no, I wouldn't necessarily link. There's no need to link. Everyone knows their website. They could type in Ticketmaster.com and go to their website anytime they want it. Um, and in, the emphasis is important. How important it is depends on the purpose of it on your page. So, again, on a direct response landing page like this where we're paying for the traffic, you kind of want to hit them over the head with, you know, the fact that these are all your clients. On the home page of Slack, you want to be a little more subtle and, and you can get away with the grayscale. By the way, take the care. I, I usually prefer to make them grayscale because, again, they're usually used in <coughs> the supporting context for most of our clients. But take the care to balance them. If you do use color, maybe desaturate really strong logos. Basically, some logos are just better and stronger than others, especially in a small size. So you want to kind of, if you're going to have a logo bar or a set of logos like this, you want to have them be roughly equal in terms of their visual impact. So take the care to actually fiddle with the logos, make certain ones smaller, less contrasty, more less saturated, whatever that means you know, in your world, but make them visually roughly equivalent because, like I said, some of them are just much stronger than others. All right, great questions. And let's go on and talk about another powerful way to transfer trust from outside authorities, media mentions. This company is a fashion brand, Karen Finch, and they make custom clothes, uh, and they've been featured in the following media outlets, Fast Company, The Atlantic, Marie Claire, Cosmopolitan, and so on. Well, that means that, you know, compared to their thousand other competitors that didn't get this kind of coverage that they're for real. So media mentions uh, and in each industry which publications matter is going to change uh, what's considered the authoritative publication but if you do have media mentions in well-known publications please 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 promote them to a visible spot. Many of you have them. You even have them on your site but guess where you're hiding them. You probably have it under about us slash company slash public relations, you know, and now three pages deep down, you have a great list of every, you know, press clipping and every media mention that you've ever had. But to have a more compact form with just the logos somewhere more prominent where it actually influences the decision, that's much more powerful. Let me give you an example. So one of our clients had this uh, real age test. Basically, they ask you a bunch of lifestyle questions and then they tell you what your quote unquote real age is. And it's not your biological, or rather, it's not your chronological age, it's your biological age. It's how well you've maintained your body. And they ask a bunch of personal questions Do you smoke? Do you exercise? Do you drink? You know, I mean, most people wouldn't want to give up that voluntarily, but that's the only way you get your real age score. And so one of the things we did in the sign up for the test was actually to add the media mentions. And most of you probably before today have never heard of Real Age, but you have heard of CNN and New York Times and the Today Show and MSNBC and so on. And because those are media brands that have spent hundreds of millions of dollars 
decades of time drumming those brands into our heads. So you get what I call the halo effect. You get an association with them. And so I may not have heard of real age, but look, CNN's heard of real age, New York Times has heard of real age. So the same people showing up, 40% more people filled out that form. The same population of people showing up. That's how powerful just putting those trust symbols on there can be. So the bottom line on borrowing trust is use it. Use it liberally. Put it more prominently on the site. Again, this is a, I told you it would be a theme. Make it more prominent, make it more visible, make it earlier in the process. In the case of brands and logos, especially awards, associations, media mentions, all of that needs to be, it can be repeated deep in your site in a more comprehensive way, but it has to be visible early in the process. Ideally, almost in that first screen full above the fold, you know when I said visual appearances are formed very quickly? So in a 20th of a second, we might form that visual first impression. Okay, professional site, check. The next question is like, can I trust them? Is this credible? Should I stick around? Oh, look, logos I recognize, check. There is half the battle. So borrow trust from better known brands. All right, let's continue on to the, the fourth um, pillar of trust, and I call this the consensus of your peers. Now, the pioneering work on this, I'm stealing from the best, was uh, done by Robert Cialdini. If you haven't read his book, Influence, go get a copy. It's, it's, it's uh, the definitive book on this, and he did a lot of original research. Uh, now, I'm a little older than probably some of the folks on the webinar, and, and so this is what I come home to um, most days. My 13-year-old playing Fortnite with his little pals. And I can tell you one thing about my 13-year-old and his little pals. They don't care what I think. Well, he tells me that. Actually, he's a lot ruder than, than saying I don't care what you think, but that's another story. Um, we'll talk to that with the counselor. Um, but what we find is that people are actually influenced by their tribes. And the way I, I know you probably don't think of yourself as tribal, but think of yourself as an overlay of many tribes. Some are voluntary, some are involuntarily, and depending on the context, your tribalism is activated. You, we're mammals, we're herd animals, we feel safer in the herd. So I feel safe if, I'm, if a lot of people, just like me, are doing something, then it's safe. Otherwise, I have anxiety. If I'm alone, that's a very scary thing for any mammal, to be alone. If you don't have the protection of the herd, the warning systems, the physical protection, any of that. So we don't like doing things that are on our own. We would rather be safer in the herd. So the key takeaway here for your peers is that we are herd animals, so you have to feel safe. And when I say we're tribal, what I mean by that is there's overlays. Your experience today, you might be a, an online marketing professional. That's one identity. Another might be that you like craft beers. Another might be that you're an only child. Another one might be that you have you know, brown eyes. Those are all different tribes. Some are voluntary, some are involuntarily involuntary, but we belong to them. Uh, and if we feel if we feel safer, if other people around us are kind of also doing the same things. Here's the most popular picture on Instagram as of a couple of months ago. As it's Kylie Jenner, one of the Kardashians, who are famous for being famous and nothing else apparently. But this was her baby. Her baby was born and and her baby was clutching her hand. It was the baby name announcement. By the way, her name, as you can see there, is Stormy Webster. Oh, how cute and original. Anyway, 18 million people like this picture. It's pretty cute, I got to say. 18 million people on Instagram. But this is not the most popular picture on Instagram today. So I have a lot of people saying, well, I'm not Kylie Jenner. I'm not famous already. My business is not sexy. We sell you know, you know, uh, tires or vacuum cleaners. It's not sexy stuff. Well, you can still indicate popularity. Here's the most popular picture on Instagram today. It's an egg. It has 53 million likes. It's the world record egg that was designed just to knock Kylie Jenner's picture off of the top spot on Instagram. And they have. It's, they have about three times as many people liking it. But here's the funny part. This is 
this egg is just an egg. There's nothing special about it. In fact, Shutterstock, our client, this is just a stock photograph of an egg from Shutterstock. So if you think your stuff is boring and not deserving of Facebook uh, likes or social media or, or anything like that, you're wrong. If an, a stock photograph of an egg can be popular, I'm sure with a little work, your stuff can be too. But my point back to tribalism is let's, let's take an example. Here's the REI uh, website, and this is a product detail page on their site. And it's for backpacking, uh, kind of day pack. And as you can see there, they, they've highlighted the fact that it has a four and a half stars. And if you click on that, then you get to the, to the bottom of the page where it has all of the reviews. Um, and reviews are very, very popular. I mean, sorry, are very, very powerful. Um, so here they have a summary at the top of the star ratings, and then they have the full text that are the reviews lower down is if you scroll. And this is something that basically is important because I only care about people in my tribe. You know, if you, you may be my best friend, we may agree on our taste in movies or whether we like sushi or not, but I don't really give a crap about your opinion of a hardcore mountaineering backpack unless, and this is very important, unless you're also a hardcore mountaineering backpacker for that moment for that decision for the decision to buy that pack my tribe is other people like me in that situation and I trust total strangers that have bought this backpack more than I trust you my best friend and sushi eating moviegoer companion so uh, there's a couple of things there's some trusted website review sites you might want to use that uh, make it clear that they're I would just say um, authentic reviews and not fakes. Another important thing is you don't want all positive reviews. Some people actually delete negative reviews off of their site. That's a big mistake. That means I can't trust you to provide positive reviews there or negative reviews rather. They're all positive. That's highly unlikely. So you know, leave the negative ones. But uh, one mistake I see people making with these kind of uh, reviews is that if you only have a couple of reviews or one review, don't post a star rating. Don't post an average. An average of one sample, a sample size of one is not an average, okay? If the first person to come along hates that product because they had a bad breakfast that day and no other reason and gives it one star, then from then on, people are going to see it in a list of other products and go, God, that's a one star product. They don't look at the fact that it's based on one review. They're just looking at the star rating. So my strong suggestion to you is wait until you have a few reviews. I don't know, five, eight, ten, whatever, you know, however popular your stuff typically gets before you post an average rating. It's okay to post the reviews themselves at the bottom of the page, but the average rating should be based on an actual average. And even five to eight is obviously not statistically significant, but it's something. It represents some kind of consensus of opinion as opposed to just one person having a bad breakfast day. So if you can turn off the rating stars from showing below a certain minimum, I highly recommend that. So the best way that I've seen this uh, done, I, I, it, was, it was a long time ago, I was getting the latest version of the Firefox browser. And this was about six weeks after it was released. And on the right, you can see, and I was deciding, should I download this latest version as opposed to you know, Microsoft Explorer? In six weeks, they had... 543 million downloads of the new browser. So that number, there's your social proof. Half a billion people did this. Half a billion people, right? But they went even further. I love this. They had an interactive map, and I was uh, doing a keynote in German at the time. So right around me, there were all these little blinking orange dots all over Europe where people were that instant downloading that browser. Talk about social proof. A huge number of people have done it and people just like me are downloading this browser right now, this second. Have you ever been to travel sites and you've seen, you're looking at some property or hotel and it says something like, yeah, 14 people are looking at this property right now. And so um, it gives you that sense of, it's happening now. People just like me are doing it right now, and that's a very powerful thing. So to kind of sum up Robert Cialdini's principles about social proof, you can kind of almost get automatic compliance to get me to agree to take action. If you show objective large numbers 
and how close these people are to me. So people, lots of people just like you have done this. So it's safe for you, the little herd animal, the little mammal, to do this as well. All right, well, I'm going to quickly go through putting all of this together. As I mentioned, these individual pillars are fine, but if you combine them, and they are all four of them, online trust, appearance, transactional assurance, borrowing authority, and consensus of peers, then you get a really strong cocktail. And usually, you know, when we uh, come to clients and we try to fix their stuff, they're missing a lot of this stuff or doing it wrong. Uh, but I'm, I'm very happy to say, I mean, the, the folks at uh, Get Response are on their game. I uh, just want to show you some examples of how they're doing this on their own website. And it's not because they asked me to. I was just looking at their site, and I'm like, you know, these guys understand the four pillars of building trust online. Their home page has a clean appearance. It's modern. It's, it's uncluttered. Uh, it's, it has clear messaging. They also, have, when you try to sign up for the free trial, they have assurances on the right. Try it free, 30 days, no credit card required. I know for a lot of us, free trial offers are great, but if there's a credit card required, you know, at the bottom they say, again, no risk, no obligations, no strings attached. It's to reassure me at that point of transaction with transactional assurances. They've also won a bunch of awards. You can see on the right-hand side, they have a long page of them and just kind of enlarged the few of them so you can see what they look like. Uh, I think those could actually be promoted to more visibly on the home page or higher up in the site. They have marquee clients. Um, you know, so again, if Hilton uses it and big companies like IKEA, then maybe you should too. And they have individual client testimonials and happy success stories. And then they have the kind of the aggregate client testimonials. So, sorry, not testimonials, but aggregate large numbers that I just talked about, 350,000 customers. So if you're thinking about whether to use them, you're safe. You're in the herd. So that is, you know, if you combine it into a super cocktail of trustworthiness on your site, that's how you get the best effect. Now, this is a slide that I'm going to show you that I put in all of my presentations. But having gone through this trust webinar with me, you'll see exactly why we do it. So when I talk about our company, I use aggregated large numbers. We made $1.2 billion dollars for our clients and here's all the clients you probably heard of a few of them um, that right there is my transfer of trust folks so I'm pulling back the curtain and showing you what's behind it that's why it works uh, those of you that are interested in some of these trust building techniques as well as other aspects of neuromarketing I want to uh, announce or uh, reannounce again that uh, this summer I'm going to be coming out with my latest book uh, called Unleashing the Primal Brain, the Essential Field Guide for Modern Marketers. It's all about how we evolved from the earliest forms of life to human beings. And uh, you can't get it yet. It's not even from pre-sale. But if you go to timash.com, you can sign up to hear the announcement of uh, when it's going to be available. But expect it out this summer. Um, if you want to get a hold of me, I'm very easy to get a hold of. I think we have time for some um, uh, questions, I believe. So, just want to leave you with one thing while we're doing the questions. If you're interested, Get Response is actually subsidizing several of our internet strategy consultations that we usually charge over a thousand for. So, if your business qualifies, just email me right now. These go usually pretty fast during the webinars, but just email Tim at Site Tuners with the subject of Get Response, and we'll do a free internet strategy consultation courtesy of Get Response for you. That's only for the first five eligible companies, so I would do that right away. All right, so let's uh, let's see if we have time for a few questions. I think we have. There we go. Okay. All right. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Tim. So uh, I'm just gonna yeah uh, have a look at the questions and please uh, feel free to you know uh, write down the questions that you have for Tim. Uh, to chat box and in the meantime uh, I collected some questions so um, uh, Michael asks uh, if it takes trust symbols to get clients how do you get clients without trust without trust uh, symbols yeah that's a great point so um, one um, if it's business to business a lot of times companies early on will do work at a very heavily discounted rates to get those marquee clients those name brands or even for free say it's a pilot project but as long as you let us publicize it you know we get to use your name to uh, 
Um, another thing you can do is just join associations. You don't have to have clients. Uh, you can, you know, have we're members of the Better Business Bureau or some other trade organization in your field um, that costs very little money and it doesn't require getting clients. And the media mentions you can do social media um, and, you know, sometimes you know, even a roundup article or something like that, you, you can say as seen in a certain publication. Um, even if you've advertised on, on a TV channel as seen as on ESPN, well, yeah, we've seen that because you paid for a commercial. Uh, so you can get trust symbols in a variety of ways like that. All right. Um, did we like? Uh, did we actually talk? Uh, we were talking about the logos, but uh, Michelle asked, uh, uh, "Can there be legal issues with using logos of other companies that buy from you?" Yeah. So again, I'm speaking only to the U.S. Um, and okay. the, the technical answer is, of course, you know, people protect their copyrights and their trademarks. But the practical answer is. It, don't worry about it. I mean, if you if I type in Coca-Cola logo right now into Google, I get millions of results. So um, I'm sure a lot of those are unauthorized uses. So if the brand doesn't police its own logo, uh, they have to actually show that they were harmed somehow by your use of it, and that's very, very unlikely. Worst case scenario, and this can happen once in a rare while, is you might get a letter from an attorney that says, get rid of that logo. And then you know what you do? you get rid of that logo. You keep the rest of them. Just don't worry about it. As a practical matter, it's not an issue. Uh, oh, just I just one, one exception, which is Oprah. There are certain brands that really police the crap out of their, of their trademarks, so don't mess with Oprah. All right. And just Rolanda asked, uh, how about there has no there has been no mention uh, of testimonials? And she asked, uh, well, be no, I, did, I did mention them. Um, so this would be people like me. So this is the testimonials and reviews are very similar. On an e-commerce site, the reviews, testimonials can be powerful on product or service sites or you know, if you're a professional services firm, you certainly want client testimonials. Absolutely. And software, like you guys, you know, you have you know, kind of client testimonials and case studies. Video testimonials are also very powerful. They don't have to be anything fancy. Just ask clients that love you. Next time they say they love you, just say, "Hey, can you say to your webcam for five seconds, you know, um, what you uh, rec what, would you recommend uh, um, us, or what would you say to somebody that's interested in working with us?" And they'll usually be glad to do that. Just stick that video file into a short little compilation that's a minute or two long, and it'll be a very powerful video set of testimonials. Okay, and there's this question that I really wanted to ask, and I don't want to skip uh, before we, we finish. Juan asked, isn't it a problem, for instance, to say, we won't never spam, spam you, possibly creating awareness of that possibly happening? You know what I mean? Yeah, well, I was talking, I believe, that's a great question. I was talking about that in the context of transactional trust. So assuring people about your privacy uh, is important so that they know you're not going to misuse it, especially in industries where people tend to misuse data, okay, or sell it to partners. If their business model is to sell it to their business partners and you're different from everyone in the industry and you don't do that, then I would be saying things like that. Uh, generally, you know, the if people talk about their privacy, that means they're usually pretty good on privacy. I don't think it'll bring up the topic of privacy as a negative. People that are bad on privacy avoid talking about it. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. Actually, yeah, that last question, and uh, I'm just going to ask uh, the last, the, the 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 actually last question that just appeared. Instead of writing your, instead writing. Would it be better to write your data is safer with us, as it says? Yeah, as opposed to something like privacy policy or we won't misuse your data. Um, the, you know, that's something that's very tactical but can be important. It depends on your circumstance. I don't have a, a one blanket answer. Uh, I would test where you put it relative to your call to action. It should be close if you want it to be a reassurance. How prominent, what wording you're using. Sometimes even have, turning it into a seal saying data privacy guarantee can be the best approach. So it's either more subtle or more obvious. I don't know what will work for you, but definitely do it around the conversion area itself where you're asking them to take action. 
after all, testing is the, the utmost important thing, right? When we have That's the ideas, right. when we have... Yeah, as, as you know, we're, uh, we're collaborating right now. I'm going to be uh, working on a video course, which we'll be putting out uh, sometime soon about how to uh, set up your testing program. So look, look forward to talking about that in a lot more detail. Definitely, definitely. And we're also looking forward to see it live. And before we finish, uh, by the way, thank you very much, Shemit. It was an amazing uh, presentation. And uh, I hope that everybody got something fruitful, something that they can apply to their business, to their day-to-day -day job, right after finishing this webinar. And before we finish, there was just one question, and that was actually directed towards us. Uh, a while ago, we, um, we announced that something new was coming up. And I just want to tell you guys that just hold on, just wait a little bit more. Soon we will announce something really big, something that will really help you uh, you know, make more money online, optimize your sales, and basically, you know, use all get response tools together to make, you know, grow your business. So that's all. Thank you very much, Tim. It's my absolute pleasure. Take care, everybody. Take care and have a great day.